In this section, we cover the adrenal medulla and the regulation of catecholamines. So uh, the sympathoadrenal system or the fight or flight response system is the system that's associated with catecholamine um, uh, regulation. So if you recall from the um, introductory section, we said the catecholamines, norepinephrine and epinephrine, are derived from the amino acid tyrosine. The tyrosine undergoes a series of reactions, as shown in this slide, to produce norepinephrine and epinephrine. Epinephrine and norepinephrine both get metabolized to their respective metabolites called metanephrine or normetanephrine, as indicated in the slide. The catecholamines, in general, work on several receptors. And the most common one are called the uh, alpha and the beta adrenergic receptors. There are two alpha receptors and two beta receptors. And both epinephrine and norepinephrine work on various re receptors to re uh, result in various functions. So, for example, epinephrine can bind to either of the alpha receptors or the beta 1 receptor or, or the beta 2 receptor to result in increase in the rate and force of contraction of heart muscles, uh, increases metabolic rate, it dilates the bronchioles, stimulates lipolysis, dilates pupils, inhibition of gastric secretion, and so on. So as you can see, epinephrine is one of these classic fight-or-flight responses, uh, hormones that uh, is necessary for um, acute stressful events. Norepinephrine, on the other hand, has a more specific and limited uh, set of activity, and especially its activity is centered around constrictions of blood vessels. And its primary function is to increase the SVR, or the systemic vascular resistance, and therefore increases blood pressure. This is one of the reasons we use norepinephrine in the ICU, especially in the situations of septic shock, because in septic shock you have very low SVR, and by using norepinephrine you can really clamp down on the vessels to increase SVR and bring the blood pressure back up again. So this is a question that talks about what happens when there is perturbation in the catecholamine system. So asymptomatic 50-year-old woman has hypertension. Urinary excretion of catecholamines is increased. A CT scan shows a suprarenal mass. Which of the following is most likely in this case? So first of all, the diagnosis, as most of you already have guessed perhaps, is pheochromocytoma, because this is a situation where you have increase in urinary catecholamine excretion and usual manifestation is hypertension. And this imaging usually shows a large adrenal mass. And pheochromocytomas are most commonly a benign neoplasm of the adrenal medulla. So the correct answer is B. And here's the uh, basic signs and symptoms and the diagnosis for how to approach pheochromocytoma. So first of all, so pheochromocytoma is a benign tumor of the adrenal medulla. And the usual presentation is headache, sweating, and palpitations. And oftentimes, physically, you, uh, uh, patients present with hypertension. There's also anxiety, nervousness, um, could have some heat, uh, heat intolerance, weight loss. And so if you look at the constellation of symptoms, you need to have a high index of suspicion to make the diagnosis of pheochromocytoma because many times, many other diagnoses can fall under this category, like heat intolerance, weight loss, nervousness can also be hyperthyroidism. Uh, sometimes people can present with chest pain as well. And so it's important to recognize that the symptom complex is fairly nonspecific, but you need to put the whole picture together. So the diagnosis is really made by measuring the catecholamines and the metabolites, and more importantly, the metabolites directly in the urine or in the plasma. So the 24-hour urine metanephrine, which is the metabolites of epinephrine and norepinephrine, is very useful um, in the urine or in the plasma. And it's important to recognize that, uh, that the metabolites are a lot more sensitive than the parent catecholamines because the parent catecholamines are very transient uh, and, and, and can get degraded quickly in the blood, whereas the metabolites can uh, stick around for a longer period of time. In this particular case, it's always important to recognize that the biochemical tests have to be done before imaging tests. And the reason for this is simply because there is at least a 1 in 10 chance of trying to find something uh, by scanning in the abdomen where you get something called an adrenal incidentaloma. So in other words, one in 10 people have an adrenal incidentaloma and you don't want to be scanning people's bellies uh, without really knowing what the diagnosis is uh, because oftentimes those lead to more anxiety, more testing and unnecessary uh, surgeries. So again, the take home message is do the biochemical test first and then the imaging test.
this is an example of how um, an adrenophobic chromocytoma looks like. Uh, they're usually not very subtle. They clearly have a suprarenal mass as shown in this MRI imaging, which is the preferred modality. There's also this something called the 10% rule of pheochromocytomas, uh, where 10% of these tumors can be malignant, 10% can be benign, uh, sorry, bilateral, 10% can be extraadrenal, and 10% can be in children and familial. 10% are associated with a syndrome called MEN, and 10% are recurrent. So again, for the most part, 90% of the part, anyway, most of these tumors are benign, are unilateral, and are sporadic. So this concludes the section on adrenal medullum, and uh, in the next section, we will cover the regulation of carbohydrate uh, metabolism and the pathophysiological consequences, which is primarily diabetes.